Hey everyone, welcome to the Latter-day Disciples podcast, coming at you with a solo episode today. I'm really excited to be here. So as you can tell, our topic today is about economic turbulence. And this is something that I felt impressed to talk about as I've been watching sort of the economic situation in the United States over the last several months. I want to put the disclaimer out that I'm not an economist. I wasn't even a math major, you guys. So please be cautious as I discuss some of the statistics and things that I have been made aware of as I've been studying the signs of the times. But I feel like this is an incredibly timely and important topic to go over. I imagine that some of the things we'll discuss today will be familiar to you but hopefully we can give you some more food for thought as we go through as well. June of 2022, this year, had an estimated inflation rate of about 8.5%. And I've heard some estimates that were higher and we're seeing values even as high as 14% or higher. Inflation, as many of you know, has risen precipitously since March 2021, month over month with the exception of December last year, which dropped a little bit before it rose in January, even exceeding what it had been in November. The cost of goods, electricity, commodities, all of these are putting a collective strain on our pocketbooks, or should I say our Apple Pay accounts. In April this year, a bag of oranges was 78 cents more than it was a year earlier. Ground beef was $1.61 more. Milk was almost 50 cents more. And those don't sound like terribly high amounts of money until you add up a week or two weeks or a month's worth of groceries, and then you realize that you're paying fifty to a hundred to two hundred dollars more on groceries a month than you were previously. Something that I learned recently is that eighty percent of the money that's in circulation right now in the United States was printed in 2020 and 2021. We have literally flooded our economy with all this brand new money. And inflation is an inevitable result of that. So, of course, with inflation comes the possibility of a recession, which is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. By the time that I'm recording this, we might already be in a recession. First quarter of 2022 was negative growth. Q2 closed just here at the end of June. So now we're in a place where we're kind of just waiting for the numbers to come out to see if we are officially in a recession or not. The conditions of a recession are a few. First off, your real income drops. So meaning that inflation plus the increased cost of goods outpaces wage growth. So for example, if at the beginning of the year you got a 3% raise with the annualized inflation rate of 8 to 12%, that means that you're actually taking a 5 to 9% loss of real wages. In times of recession, it becomes a lot harder to take out loans due to increased interest rates. So one of the ways that the federal government tries to manage inflation is by increasing interest rates. The Federal Reserve manages this. And doing so makes things like buying a car, buying a house become a lot more challenging to do. I personally know several families who were in the housing market and then this year have been priced out of the housing market as a result of inflation and and the changes in interest rates. Unemployment also has a tendency to rise as companies struggle to deal with decreased demand or increased supply. In our situation right now, we have a high amount of demand. We have a lot of dollars that are looking for somewhere to go, looking for something to purchase, and we don't have enough supply to meet that demand. So companies might respond to that by decreasing the number of employees that they have on board. In real terms, for families and individuals, a recession can indicate loss of income, partially or or entirely, and I think as most people can attest to, financial stress has a real impact on day-to-day living. Another quality that we might be seeing in the economy in the near future is something called stagflation, which is essentially high inflation and high unemployment. This increases prices, decreases demand, it can devalue goods or homes, and generally speaking can lead to national impoverishment that we've seen in other countries specifically. 
All of this is not to say anything of an economic depression. No one alive today, most likely, or very few people alive today, I wish I should say, were around for the depression back in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago at this point. Depressions are often the result of a period of negative activity based on GDP. It's a lot worse than a recession with GDP falling significantly and it usually lasts for many, many years. In 1930, the Great Depression lasted for a decade and unemployment rose to 25%, meaning that one in four people were unemployed with no job to turn to and wages fell by almost 42%. So significantly higher than what we were talking about, a real wage loss of you know, in our example, somewhere between 5 and 9% right now. Uh, a quote that I found said, a recession is a period in which you tighten your belt. A depression is a time in which you have no belt to tighten. All of this can come back to fairly predictable patterns when it comes to, you know, deficits that we're running, inflation that results in that, um, and, and et cetera. But even aside from the conditions of our economy generally, there are so many things that can happen that can put financial burden on individuals and families. James E. Fowl said, aside from the economic tides which run in the affairs of nations, financial hard times can befall any of us at any time. There's no guarantee against personal hard financial times. Financial difficulty may result from several kinds of misfortunes, including all types of natural disasters, such as floods, fires, and earthquakes. Accidents and illness can produce unexpected and staggering medical and hospital bills. The misfortunes of other family members may require our help, etc. When it comes to the last days, economic instability is a hallmark. And there have been a number of prophetic statements and scriptures that foreshadow what will invariably constitute economic collapse of society at large in the not-too-distant future. Brigham Young had a quote that said, the time will come that gold will hold no comparison in value to a bushel of wheat. Another quote that I found from Ezra Taft Benson said, let us not be dissuaded from preparing because of seeming prosperity today or so-called peace. I have seen the ravages of inflation. I shall never forget Germany in the early 1920s. So this is just post-World War I. In December 1923 in Cologne, Germany, I paid 6 billion marks for breakfast. That was just 15 cents in American money. Today, the real inflation concern is in America and several other nations. Obviously, Ezra Taft Benson was a while ago, and we haven't really changed our ways. If anything, we've gotten a lot worse. J. Reuben Clark also said, when we really get into hard times where food is scarce or there is none at all, and so with clothing and shelter, money may be no good, for there may be nothing to buy, and you cannot eat money, you cannot get enough of it together to burn to keep you warm, and you cannot wear it. All of these prophetic statements are serving to paint a picture of what they knew was coming, again, as a condition of the last days in the tribulation that will precede the second coming of the Lord. In addition to these prophetic quotes, the scriptures have many instances where prosperity is swiftly taken away, preceding the downfall of nations. In Helaman 13, it talks about a curse shall come upon the land because of the people's sake who are upon the land, yea, because of their wickedness and their abominations. And it shall come to pass, saith the Lord of hosts, yea, our great and true God, that whoso shall hide up treasures in the earth shall find them again no more. And he that hideth not up his treasures unto me, cursed is he, and also the treasure, and none shall redeem it because of the curse of the land. And they day shall come that they shall hide up their treasures because they have set their hearts on riches. And because they have set their hearts on riches and will hide up their treasures when they shall flee before their enemies, because they will not hide them up unto me, cursed be they and also their treasures. And in that day shall they be smitten, saith the Lord. Isaiah 1 also has a reference to this. He says, your silver has become dross, your wine diluted with water. So literally, your silver has become worthless. Your money means nothing. Figuratively speaking, this is also talking about our stature when it comes to worldliness. Uh, all of these things are going to be brought low. There have been many prophets and apostles over the years who have warned us against prosperity, who have said that the greatest fear that they have for members of the church 
will be our prosperity. And we see this particularly in the Book of Mormon as it goes through the pride cycle, that prosperity always precedes pride and pride always is followed by downfall. Ezra Taft Benson said, nations oft times sow the seeds of their own destruction, even while enjoying unprecedented prosperity, even before reaching the zenith or the peak of their power. I think history clearly indicates that this is often the case. When it appears that all is well, oft times the very seeds of destruction are sown, sometimes unwittingly. Most of the great civilizations of the world have not been conquered from without until they have destroyed themselves from within by sowing these seeds of destruction. We know from Book of Mormon prophecy that that will be the case with the United States as well. I include this first off to give a warning that right now many of you might be looking around and whether or not you're paying attention to the economic situation of the United States, you might have a tendency and a desire to say all is well we're good. We've got money. We've got jobs. Don't anticipate anything changing on the horizon. And I just want to put out the warning that just because we're not seeing anything yet doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. In fact, we have a lot of evidence to the contrary. So all this being said, what can we do? What can we do to prepare against hard economic times that most likely we all will face some point in the future, whether it be a complete economic collapse, or a personal loss of income or resources. Gordon B. Hinckley said many of our people are living on the very edge of their incomes. In fact, some are living on borrowings. I urge you to be modest in your expenditures, discipline yourselves in your purchases to avoid debt to the extent possible. Pay off debt as quickly as you can and free yourselves from bondage. We haven't heard prophets talk about this topic very recently, at least in my personal knowledge and memory, but that doesn't mean that this is outdated prophetic counsel. The same with any counsel that prophets have given since the restoration and beforehand. Debt is a form of bondage, and bondage is Satan's game. That's his objective for us. Debt represents a drain on resources that you otherwise need to be preparing for the future because of financing requirements for choices that you made in the past. You're literally robbing yourself, your family, of the things that you need to be focused on in order to be prepared. In a recession, job loss, inflation, all of these things are already going to put a strain on budgets. Paying off debt and the accompanying interest that is the especially toxic element of death, of debt, is one of the wisest investments that can be made. Recently, we have had some changes in our own situation as we've had jobs change. Uh, my husband's a real estate agent, so finances are always fluctuating. And we've had a lot of questions about how we need to be spending our money. Do we need to be saving it? Do we need to just throw all of it at emergency prep? Um, how much of it can we enjoy? And in a blessing that I received, the Lord instructed me to focus on paying off debt. We don't have any credit card debt. We don't have any car debt. We have one student loan, my husband's student loan yet. Um, and I find it really interesting that given all the other revelation the Lord has given me, that the focus he wants me personally to have is on paying off debt. I don't know exactly why that will be. I imagine that there are situations in the future that if we fail to heed this prophetic counsel, the fact that we have debt will come back to bite us. I don't know exactly what that is or how that's going to look, but it's a feeling and a thought that I've had. Go through your budget if you don't have a budget, make one. <laughs> and then go through your budget and make adjustments. If there are expenditures that are on there, especially ones that might be distracting you from the work and the preparation that God would have you invested in, make some changes. I know that it's an act of faith. I know it requires sacrifice. So does the Lord. He always makes our sacrifices more than worth it. A quick note about self-reliance. I want to pose some questions to you that I hope you will sincerely go through with your spouse, with your roommates, with your children, whatever your situation might be, 
and seriously consider how you might answer these questions. So first off is, how would you subsist if you were to lose your source of income tomorrow? If you lost your job, if your husband died, what would you do in that situation? What additional skills or knowledge do you need in order to feel like you can not just survive but flourish in challenging circumstances? There are a lot of old time skills and knowledge that we have lost because of our prosperity. If there were not grocery stores, people would hurt. What do you need to learn? What do you need to go back to? This can be a really fun exercise too. My daughter recently went on a camping trip with her grandparents and I'm so grateful for that because when you're camping, you're living in the middle of nowhere, there's a lot you have to learn how to do. You have to learn how to get water, how to clean water in some circumstances, how to cook food, how to start a fire. There are a lot of skills that youth today are missing out on by virtue of the comforts that we enjoy. And I think it would be important to evaluate and say, What if I didn't have these comforts? What resources do you need to have on hand to meet the basic needs of your family? Obviously, this initially goes to food storage and water, which is critical. But what else do you need? Do you have medical needs that need to be considered? Do you need some of the equipment that goes along with the skills and knowledge that we were just talking about? If money were no longer a reliable medium of exchange... What could you do? What could you offer in exchange for some of the necessities? I think it's entirely likely that with the economic situations that are in our future, trade and bartering are going to be a thing. So what do you have that you could trade? What do you have that you could barter? Is it a service? Is it a good? Do you have enough on hand for it actually to make a difference for more than one meal? Beyond all of this, I want you to consider your spiritual self-reliance. What if you didn't have access to a hard copy of the scriptures? What if, for some reason, we weren't able to hear the prophet's voice regularly? D. Todd Christofferson said, The blessings of temporal self-reliance become especially obvious in times of crises, such as natural disasters, unemployment, or financial turmoil. But spiritual self-reliance is equally crucial. I would say perhaps more crucial in such times. Those with a firm foundation are blessed with peace, reassurance, and greater faith when calling on Heavenly Father for help. Take some time to evaluate how you would answer these questions. And don't just think about it. Do something about it. We all have areas that we can improve in these ways. Your future self, your children, others that you will be blessed to serve will thank you for doing meaningful mental and physical work now to prepare for challenges in the future. We need to be seeking revelation throughout this entire process. D. Todd Christofferson also said self-reliance should not be mistaken for complete independence. After all, we are ultimately dependent on our Heavenly Father for everything. We need his continual guidance, preservation, and protection. I know people who take a doomsday approach to their self-reliance and I'm really in awe of those people. I think that they're amazing. A lot of times they have some really fascinating skills and uh, a lot of resources, but I don't think that that is a practical or sustainable approach, especially given the amount of time that we might have. And so you have to do the spiritual work to pray and study and understand what is going to be the most vital for your family in times of scarcity. That isn't going to be everything. We aren't all going to go through all of the challenges. It's going to be customized to you, but it takes you initiating that process of revelation. So do it (laughs) and do it now. Neil A. Maxwell said, an economic depression would be grim, but it would not change the reality of immortality. The inevitability of the second coming is not affected by the unpredictability of the stock market. A case of cancer does not cancel the promises of the temple endowment. All that matters is gloriously intact. 
the promises are in place, it is up to us to perform. I want to remind everyone that there are blessings that come from enduring hardship. James E. Faust said, The great suffering of the Savior in Gethsemane and his crucifixion were calamities, but man was redeemed from death and hell by his atoning sacrifice. The scattering of Israel throughout the world sprinkled the blood that believes so that many nations may now partake of the gospel plan. The history of the Nephites is one of trial, calamities, and suffering, but through it all, the experiences gained brought strength and development. One of the important things to remember about the tribulation that we may be called to pass through in the coming days is that it can result in our purification and in our sanctification if we will allow it to. C.H. Spurgeon said, The Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction. Edmund Burke said, Difficulty is a severe instructor set over us by the supreme ordinance of a parental guardian and legislator who knows us better than we know ourselves, and he loves us better too. He that wrestles with us strengthens our nerves and sharpens our skill. Our antagonist is our helper. The refiner's fire is inevitable in the future if we are to become the disciples that the Savior needs us to be. And we can choose now to change our attitude about that. We could shrink and shy away from it. We could be fearful. We could be angry. We could long like prophets of old that these were not our times, that we lived in the Pride and Prejudice era (laughs) of the movie that I watched last night that I find so idyllic and beautiful, even though I know that it was like a terrible time in history to live. We can want that or we can turn it around and say, I am going to be asked to go through hard things and that's okay because it's going to make me a stronger person. It's going to help me rid myself of the weaknesses and the sins that easily beset me. It is going to increase my reliance on a perfect Savior who is more than capable of not just seeing me through the fire, but of making every second in the fire worth it to me. In the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew chapter 6, verse 38, it says, Wherefore, seek not the things of this world, But seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't try to avoid this hard trip. Don't set your heart upon the riches of the world. Instead, give your heart to God. Go to work for him. Choose to sacrifice, to deepen your adherence to covenants. And as you do so, I promise, and more importantly, the Lord has promised that everything that we need will be provided. I love you guys. Have an awesome week.